So uh, scientific theories are, um, are anti-fragile. That means that they get better and stronger the more they are critiqued. And uh, NFTs are getting a lot stronger in the last year. <laughs> <laughs> so right off the bat, I, I want to acknowledge his many contributions. I think dyadic completion is really cool. I mean, it's, you know, it, it fits well with what I've seen about post hoc justification, like the victim just pops into your mind, even if it, there isn't a big one. So I think dyadic completion is great work. It's a, it's a big contribution to moral psychology. Um, I think Kurt has shown that care, harm is the most common foundation in daily life, and that's true for conservatives as well as liberals. Uh, at least especially in America and Western cultures, uh, the effect is quite large. I have been saying that since my dissertation, that we have a harmless culture. Uh, but Kurt has forced us to change a little bit the way we talk about um, the relative importance of the foundations. And third, I agree with him that the CAD model uh, is overstated. Um, back in the 90s, I was really interested in basic emotions because there are all these intriguing connections between these moral emotions and moral judgments. And so Paul Ross and I wrote this CAD paper, and we were hopeful that this was going to be the way to approach moral psychology, and Daphne Count and I were going to write a paper on three other emotions, uh, but I couldn't really get it to work out neatly. It, it, Kurt's right that it's not a one-to-one -one relation between emotions and judgments or behaviors. So by the 2000s, I moved on to smaller bits of cognition, to intuitions, moral intuitions, uh, which I defined as the sudden appearance and consciousness of a moral judgment, including an affective valence. Um, <clears throat> So then when I was trying to figure out, okay, what are, what are all these intuitions? That's when I started reading a lot of anthropology. I did a postdoc with Rick Schwader. And when you read ethnographies, you look around the world, you find all these moral concepts. And they're not the same everywhere, but they're similar. A lot of them are very similar around the world. And so that starts you thinking, like, what's going on? That there's all this similarity and all this difference. What we found is that if you group them by the, the adaptive challenges, uh, that, that, that humans have faced for a long time, suddenly everything falls into shape, everything falls into these uh, really interesting and, uh, uh, these interesting categories. Um, and so we didn't do any evolutionary thinking ourselves. We didn't make up any just-so stories. We said, well, look, you know, there's like reciprocal altruism, nature theory and evolutionary thinking, and boy, the reciprocity rings among the Kula in the South Pacific, but boy, that sure looks like reciprocal altruism. So uh, just looking at things that other people were saying in evolutionary theory just matched on so well with things that we saw in anthropology, and that was the origin of the theory. Um, dyadic morality takes a very different view. Uh, it says uh, not, you don't need to focus on any of that, just focus on one, uh, one template. Um, agent causes suffering to patient. I fully agree it's a very important template, but I just don't understand how finding one template tells you that there can't be any others. What's really going on here, I think, between me and Kurt and, and our, our various collaborators, is a gigantic difference in the philosophy of science. So we all agree with Occam that plurality should not be positive without necessity, but there's two very different ways to look at that. One way to implement it is to say, well, let's use Occam's chainsaw. Uh, that's a view that says, get it down to one. One is the best. One is the most parsimonious. And so, uh, Senator Clayton and I call it uh, Occam's chainsaw. And this has been a very influential tool in history of moral psychology, that morality is one thing. Um, we think, however, uh, that we should follow Einstein. Einstein also agreed simpler is better, uh, but he said, don't make it so simple that you're knocking out good descriptions of the reality you're trying to describe. The supreme goal is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. This view also, uh, we call it Einstein safety razor, this view also is well represented in, in moral psychology, especially from people who study culture. Um, so what is moral foundations theory? And Kurt mentioned the, the key criteria, and actually from his descriptions too, we really do agree pretty close on the first three, um, and our divergence is on the fourth, or the nature of, of the fourth. So nativism, cultural learning, intuitionism, pluralism. And by the way, these are falsifiable. I mean, are these moral intuitions innate? I mean, you could look at babies, and if babies show no sign of them until they've learned them from the environment, that would falsify the, the nativism. But we have Paul Bloom here. You know, you look at babies, stuff seems to be coming out of their heads, not just going, not just going in. Um, so let me just say a word about modularity. Uh, as Kurt said, that is a, a critical concept here. Um, and he and Chelsea have tried to make us out to be these hard modularists. That moral foundations theory says that there are six individual discrete modules. They're Fodorian model modules. They are sort of hard, discrete. If one is firing, the other isn't. But we've never said anything like that. Um, we have long been searching for the foundations of intuitive ethics. What I think Kirk hasn't really grappled with, or I think hasn't acknowledged, is that the, the 
the uh, foundations are developmental constructs. It's from a cultural developmental theory. The foundations are the things that evolution gave us. They're learning modules of the sort described by Dan Sperber that then generate lots of other modular-like intuitions. Um, and the quote that, that he gave from my book is not quite right. Uh, I do use the word little switches, but I wasn't saying that moral foundations are little switches. So we can, we can drag up the quote later. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so, uh, as we say in some of our writing, uh, you don't have to embrace modularity or any particular view of the brain to embrace MFT. You only need to accept that there's a first draft of the moral mind, and that's the definition uh, from Gary Marcus, which I really like, just that there's some structuring in advance. That's what we're trying to explain in moral foundations theory, all this weird similarity across cultures. Um, so, uh, we have a pluralist view, cultures build uh, all kinds of moral constructs, like honor is a really complicated construct. It's not one foundation, it, it draws on reciprocity and, and, and authority and sanctity. So, you know, lots of cultural concepts draw on many foundations, many ideas, many uh, sentiments. Um, Monism is a very different idea. It says all morality is understood through the lens of harm, through one, one principle. Now, if Kurt meant harm to be just like disutility, somebody is doing something negative, something bad to someone else, then we have an issue of semantics, and then we, we probably we could reconcile what we're talking about. But I think what makes dyadic morality interesting is that it doesn't take that easy way out. It's very specific. It says harm is person. It involves the perception of two interacting minds, one mind intentionally causing suffering to another mind. That's the key. That's what the template is all about. That's what gives us some content. Ellsberg Kurt has said that impurity may be just perceived harm involving sex. Well, is it? Can we explain everything just by looking at perceived harm involving sex? There's an enormous amount of evidence now for divergent validity, uh, for the importance and uniqueness of sanctity. If we were to print it all out and run the printouts together, it would stretch the galaxy far, far away. <laughs> so uh, Jesse and I have just been gathering some of this stuff. Uh, we're just making a document. We're going to put this all up. You can't read it, but I'll go through the four categories in just a moment. Um, we're going to put it, tomorrow we'll put it all up at moralfoundations.org slash critiques so you can see all the different criticisms of MFT and our responses and that, and that list. I'll just mention a couple, uh, just one from each category. So, uh, one, that sanctity outpredicts uh, harm. When Senate Kaleva led uh, our effort to look at moral judgments that people made about cultural issues, uh, and we found that when we were asking people about all these sorts of things, uh, what happened is that you actually can predict people's cultural judgments uh, pretty well using moral foundations theory. So obviously, if you know pe where people are on a one to seven scale of left right, obviously you know something about the attitudes about abortion, gay marriage, etc. So that no no doubt about that. But do you gain something by adding in moral foundations theory by adding in the MFQ? You see that? Okay. Um, and the answer is yeah, you gain a lot, and it's overwhelmingly sanctity. I mean, this really it surprised us. It jumped. Sanctity was like the magic foundation. It's like, you know, if you want to predict, you know, and actually I'm writing a paper right now with Emily Eakins, um, you know, support for uh, Trump and Cruz and all those guys. I mean, Cruz especially, because, you know, sanctity really matters for predicting uh, things above and beyond others. And it's not just sex plus harm. So flag burning, what's wrong with flag burning? Obviously, if you're conservative, you're more against it, but it's not that you're harming the flag. Again, through that, that whole column, how sensitive you are to issues of care harm doesn't add on to prediction, but how much you see invisible essences of the sort that Jeremy was talking about, that really does. So if you see the flag as a sacred object that has its own inner essence that must be protected, well, that's, that's what's really going on. Same with gambling. So this is not, the culture is not just harm plus sex. Um, uh, Kurt also mentioned this new study from, uh, uh, from Ortez and Jesse. Uh, so, uh, you know, purity predicts, out predicts harm if you want to look at social networks. Uh, and Jesse says that you did correct for weirdness, or what was it in the, in the second study? Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, we can go, you know, that thing you know, We can find out the details, but in, in the big picture, there's just tons and tons of evidence for divergent validity. Another set of studies, uh, Matt, uh, Matthew Feinberg and Rob Willer have shown, and many others, uh, that sanctity can do things. You can do things with sanctity. You can change people's minds. You can affect the world. And if you don't know about it, if you're just going to make your arguments in terms of consequences and harm, you don't get that far. Um, another set of studies from uh, Alec Chaproff and Leanne Young, they've done a lot of studies showing that the two different kinds of issues are processed differently so it's cognitively in terms of how we attribute intention and intentionality, how they interact with other factors. Um, 
Uh, and uh, and in, the, in many of their studies, the differences remain athlete controlled for severity and weirdness. Um, they've recently traced the differences back to brain activity in the RTPJ. So there's a huge amount of research using very different methods. Yeah, a lot of them do use the weird scenarios, but there's a lot of studies that don't. Um, and finally, conservatives value sanctity more overall. So uh, I was an author on the paper with, uh, with Jeremy about the, the liberal sanctity. <clears throat> yeah, we all have these. <clears throat> we all have these taste buds. We all have this ability to make to see things as sacred or sanct uh, uh, sanctified. Uh, conservatives just use it more on average. And I think the Hoffman study with, uh, with Linda Skip and others here is the gold standard now. This is what they found. The, some of you saw this in the talk yesterday. Um, so yeah, care issues. When you're asking people if you see something good or bad, yeah, it's mostly helping and harming. That's absolutely that's absolutely right. I don't doubt that. Um, but um, the the other moral foundations added a lot, and all the differences that we predicted showed up. Uh, conservatives really did use sanctity. They reported more sanctity judgments, both on the good and the bad side. So I think this is a, a quite good validation from from uh, from a team that had nothing to do with moral foundations theory for all, all of our major claims. And let me note, obviously, the care harm bar is the biggest. But again, I've been saying that since 1993. We live in an harm-based society. We live in a secular society that's overwhelmingly about harm. MFT becomes especially useful when you go around the world, uh, when you look at issues outside of sort of the normal. So uh, yeah, if you, want to just, if you need just one foundation to explain morality, you should pick harm and care. Jeremy's uh, uh, Curtis right about that. But you don't have to have just one. You're allowed to have one. So, uh, in conclusion, um, I think um, Kurt says that uh, Kurt says that harm is a lens. Uh, it's, it's a lens that, that we can look through, and I think that's right and that's fair. But there are other lenses. I think sanctity is a lens too. And the question that we face in the field of moral psychology is: Should we take away that lens? Should we stop looking through that lens? We just see it as just they're just varieties of harm. So, should we? Gray out everything, as it were. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'm just, you know, look around. I mean, look around the world. The world is going to hell, it seems. And a lot of it has to do with issues of sanctity and things that, you know, if you don't understand why the world is going to hell, then probably you might, you know. I mean, this is at least a part of the story. So Donald Trump, what on earth is going on with Donald Trump? Um, why was he so disgusted by Hillary's bathroom break? Now, you could say, oh, there's something going on with you know, Trump's appeal to purity and sanctity, and he's a germaphobe, and maybe this is influencing his approach to politics. Uh, or you could embrace dyadic morality and gray it out and just say, look, nothing to see here, folks. It's just different kinds of harm. Clearly, Hillary is the agent. And when she went to the bathroom, the country was the patient, and she peed on us or something. <laughs> um, um, and you know, good luck explaining terrorist morality. If terrorism is, I mean, there's a lot of motives for terrorism, there's a lot of work on it. But part of it, as, as cataloged in this, in this wonderful book by, by uh, Alan Fisk and, and uh, Kate Dry, um, a lot of killing is really morally motivated. And so if you look at ISIS, is ISIS doing this orgy of violence because they're so upset about harm committed to them? Or is there something else going on with the sanctity of their land, with killing infidels? Um, so again, I think you need it to understand. So um, in conclusion, our advice is stay away from Auckland's chainsaw. Um, uh, embrace Einstein's safety razor instead. Uh, and I think Nick Kristof sums it up beautifully in a recent column, describing the moral controversies and the massive misunderstandings that we're seeing on a lot of our campuses, what's going on. Uh, so Nick channeled Isaiah Berlin, who's really the patron saint of Rick Schwader, Rick's, Rick's favorite philosopher, um, and the patron saint of pluralists everywhere. Um, Isaiah Berlin argued that there was a deep human yearning to find the one great truth. In fact, he said, that's a dead end. Um, our fate, is to struggle with a plurality of values, with competing truths, with trying to reconcile what may well be irreconcilable. That's unsatisfying, it's complicated, it's also life. Thank you.